Welcome everybody to the second episode of the second season of Hello Zafi Go, uh, which is a platform that uh, zafigo.com is um, having to talk about many, many issues, mostly related to travel. And today we are talking about traveling, even though we can't do a lot of traveling these days, let's not forget uh, that uh, we're still kind of stuck within our borders at least. Uh, but it's, today we're going to talk about holidays, meaning um, travel with children, particularly little children. Now I'm a long way from having any more little children to travel with. Uh, my kids are all adults now, but I do remember very well what it was like uh, to travel with them. Uh, my oldest uh, was born when we lived in Japan, so naturally I had to travel home with her and her first flight was when she was three months old and um, I must say uh, traveling with babies, I think they have more luggage than the rest of us. There's so much to think about, whether it's their clothes or their car seat or their milk and their diapers and everything and you know having to have all this stuff with you uh, on board. Plus, of course, everyone looks at you a bit askance um, when you bring a baby on. Uh, but I'm proud to say that my babies are always very well behaved and they didn't create too much trouble. In fact, they created, or at least the eldest, uh, sat in her baby cot and uh, waved like a queen to the entire cabin. Uh, who waved back actually they were very happy to wave back so and every time i scolded her she would put up a show and and uh cry <laughs> fake cry so that i looked like a bad mummy and i had to pull her down quickly but nevertheless um it's still an ongoing issue for many of us because uh there are so many oh Lech is here hello Lech from london um there are many of us who um uh, still traveling uh, with young children, particularly even slightly older children. You know, if you have several of them, it's a it's a task for any mother and any father uh, to keep them occupied and not bored and not have to keep hearing, "Are we there yet?" You know how it is. Um, but today, so I think today it's a really relevant topic. Uh, it might not be so much about flying somewhere but um it could be uh since we are allowed to go on domestic uh holidays it could be about uh going on car trips uh around around the country which is another thing that i remember terribly from my childhood but things are much better now now that we have aircon cars and stuff like that so today i have two wonderful women uh, who are young and have young children and still do all sorts of things um, and they're going to talk to you about how they've been taking their children traveling and coping with them sometimes well and sometimes not but that's okay we'll talk about all the issues first person we have is deborah deborah chan uh, hi deborah hey everyone Thank you for joining us. Uh, before, before I, um, I start completely, I just want to tell everyone, uh, we're keeping you all on mute. Uh, and also, um, videos are off mostly, so that uh, we won't hear any untoward noises uh, from your uh, background. We've had that happen before where, you know, husbands or children come into the room and, and interrupt us. So, but later on, um, you'll be able to ask questions on the chat and at the very end, we'll get everyone to turn their videos on so that we can take a group photo. Okay, so right now, it will just be uh, me and our two speakers. So, uh, Deborah Chan um, is a Zafigo X alumnus. Uh, she's, yes, uh, that's how we met her a few years ago. 
And we wanted that time we got her to come and talk about how she upped and took her whole family, husband and one child at a time, right? Yep. To go to Cambodia to build schools and and uh, literacy centers, train and develop local leaders and teachers, and kickstarted a volunteer program called Storm Short Term Operation Relief Mission. And since then, Storm has seen over 200 volunteers from Malaysia, Singapore, and Australia. Apart from that, Deborah has written a book called Live to Last, which is a heart gripping memoir written to inspire youth and young adults to step up and step out to make a difference in this world. And she shares pivotal events that have shaped her perspective on life. And that's been quite a few right including the crumbling of the world trade center which oh yeah must have been a quite a you know heart-stopping moment um and um deborah also has a blog called ardenttraveler.com and uh, she has her book also on a website live to lastbook.com and recently uh she started a podcast called hardtolast.com. And uh, since we're all cronies, she had me on that one <laughs> a few weeks ago for Malaysia Day was, Absolutely. right? Yeah. So before I start talking to Deborah, I'll introduce our other guest, Lu Xianxia, who is the Special Projects Coordinator for Machi.com. <laughs> I love that name. Um, if, if you all don't know yet, machi.com, which is spelled machi.com, is an online parenting platform for urban mothers and fathers who are passionate about supporting and uplifting families. I actually follow you on Instagram, and it's very interesting. All the, all the very helpful stuff, um, information for for parents which i wish i had when i had my uh, little kids uh, quite a long time ago uh, but very helpful i'm sure to all the new parents uh, and and their little kids these days um lucian um is kind of currently working on a much sheet report to promote family friendly work life practices and career comebacks. Our lives don't end when we have babies, right? We, we have careers that we can go back to. And uh, used to be a lawyer, but has made a career change to events management and public relations and doing all this um, concert, working for a concert hall. That's not the concert hall that I know, is it? I think there's only, only one classical only one. concert okay. hall in okay. Malaysia. Then we must, we must yeah. have come across each other before. Yes, so, I don't think so. Yeah, so let, let's uh, kick off this with, uh, let me ask um, Deborah, who has been to so many places. Um, your trips are to places that are a bit out of the way, right? You, you've gone to... Cambodia, you go to the interior of Sabah now where, where you live and I hope you're not going to the interior of Sabah right now. Um, no, I'm in, I'm in KK, just staying put here. Yeah. Just yeah, stay put. Yeah, um, yeah. So in all these travels, you know, I mean, most parents, I mean, we want to take our children traveling and um, not just to big cities and all that. We do want them to see a bit more of the world, but when you have children, you, you do tend to worry, you know, about the safety, you know, and, and things like that. I know I didn't take uh, my kids to India until they were past a certain age, um, maybe around seven or eight, because I was worried that if they were too young, I didn't know what they might catch and then don't know where to get, you know, um, help and, and all that. So... What, uh, what did you worry about that when you sort of scooped up the lot and went off to Cambodia? Absolutely. I think it's something that we should worry about. If we don't, then, you know, you know, that's, that's 
the basic role of a parent to take care of your child. Um, so safety and also health is on the top priority list. And although it sounds a bit uh, way off going into the rural parts of Cambodia, uh, maybe a disclaimer would be uh, it wasn't my first time there. And so I had gotten to know the community over a period of time. Um, so my husband and I would make you know, frequent trips every year uh, for a week or 10 days. And so I fairly know the community. I fairly know, you know, uh, the, the amenities. Uh, I, I know that there are clinics, small, um, and there are also like bigger ho uh, hospitals in Siam Reap as, as well as in Phnom Penh. So, uh, so just a disclaimer, like, you know, I think going to places that are not very child-friendly or it can be a bit adventurous and out of the way, I think, uh, I think as parents, we need to do our research first. If we've not been there, then, you know, do as much research as you can on, on the net and um, ask as many people as you can. But most importantly, I think my, the first trip that I brought Seth when he was uh, three months old, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't for a holiday. Actually, it was for a community trip. So um, I, uh, my husband and I were heading a, a group of volunteers and bringing uh, 25 volunteers over to run an education camp in rural Cambodia. So it was kind of like a work trip. And I knew that it, was, you know, it, was, it wasn't a kickback holiday where I could just you know, have a spa, have a you know, nice drink and just enjoy the the holiday with the family. Um, and so I had to think about safety and, um, and I consulted actually three doctors uh, before we packed and, and, and left uh, just for that trip. It wasn't a pack and go. So, so that wasn't the moving to Cambodia. Um, and so I, I consulted three doctors uh, and I, we had waited for Seth to finish all his vaccinations before the doctors gave a go ahead. And so at three months, the doctors checked his general health and he was fine. And then the planning began. Um, so there was a whole list of what to bring and stuff like that. But just on the topic of health and safety, I think just as parents, if you're going on the first trip, the best is uh, just to pack basic medication. Um, so your fever, cough and flu meds uh, with a syringe if you are you know, bringing a baby. Um, and so that would be your first aid kit together with bandages and stuff like that. And that's your first line of, uh, of, of defense in case you need to see a, uh, you, your, your child fall sick. Um, and that way you wouldn't need to hunt down for a doctor and things like that. A thermometer would also be very, very useful in times like that. Um, so I think, you know, with, with the whole pandemic and things like that, um, thermometers are a plus and, and a must actually. And then with all the your, your mask and just basic medication. Uh, but seek medical advice. Uh, so for normal healthy children, uh, just tell your doctor, your regular doctor or your family doctor that you, you will be going to this place or that place. And then they, he or she will be able to advise you on what kind of vaccinations uh, is necessary and stuff like that. So yeah, you're right to say, um, should we worry about it? We should, and we should take precautionary steps. Yeah. Right. Uh, having said that, I'll go to Lucien because Lucien had this story about the first time she took her baby on a trip and came down with fever and, and you had to go looking for, for a doctor at that time. How, how was that? I mean, what, was that really worrying? Because I know someone who flew, you know, like 12 hours to go on holiday, landed there baby had a fever and she just turned around and came home. Uh, but, you know, how did you cope with it, Lucien? Well, I should have definitely asked Deb for some tips before I left. Because <laughs> for some reason, I don't know why, you always think it will never happen to you, right? So you think, ah, oh, just our first trip is just to, you know, Thailand, we'll be fine. We were attending a friend's wedding. So when we got there, actually we were halfway through the trip trip when we realized that he had a fever and we were really lucky because uh, the hotel that we stayed in had a clinic so there was a doctor and we managed to see the doctor and I also consulted with our pediatrician back home so luckily she answered and she reassured me and she told me what to do um, and after we saw the doctor we said okay you know we'll just get the medication and that was another adventure because over there, they don't prescribe in the same places like in the UK. So you get the prescription from the doctor, then you have to go to the pharmacy yourself and find one. So it's separate. Right. So we had to go to the pharmacy and then tell them what we needed. 
Um, but after that, luckily, he recovered in 24 hours. Oh. So that was a relief. I can tell you after that, I remembered to pack medication. Right. Lesson, Lesson that you mentioned. Lesson learned. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and all those things. And a thermometer is, was definitely one of the must-haves for traveling from then on. Yeah. We forget, right? Babies are fragile. And yes. you don't know what what they can pick up, you yeah. know, sometimes. They're still re having difficulty regulating their body temperature at that age. So they, exactly. they don't know how to, yeah, to adjust exactly. accordingly. So any exactly. small changes, they feel it more than us. Yeah. Right, exactly. So Debra, back to you. Um, you travel a lot with Seth uh, at first. And then you had Enya who is only who is three years younger right yep so is there a difference between traveling with one child and with two uh, especially two different children um how how do you to cope with that um, it's a lot more work. yeah yeah i'm sure i'm <laughs> sure it is so, you know double the packing and i don't know double the toys or what you know what what do you do well, it's a lot more work, but I, I can also say it's a lot more fun because traveling with two, you get to see like, you know, it's just a change of family dynamics. Um, when two parents are, you, uh, a par you know, parents are dotted on one kid and then you have two, you kind of like, you know, split the load. So then the dynamics changes. Um, I would say for me, uh, so between my two children, they are seven and four now. So they're three years apart. Uh, the age gap is, is uh, just nice. Um, they uh so when i actually anya went on her first trip as well at three months old um both of them are quite uh actually they're quite adaptable uh children um so they had actually no fuss at, at all uh just traveling i think maybe it's the you know i have this thing uh with i tell new moms all the time with babies and when when we're traveling or not uh, the key to parenting or one of the keys to, to good parenting really young children is just to be two steps ahead of them. So you kind of like, you know, uh, you kind of preempt what will happen and then hopefully you're two steps ahead of them. So before their meltdown, you kind of know what, you know, what they're, uh, what they're going to do already. And so you try to stop their meltdown. So uh, with traveling with two or more children, I would say it takes a lot of teamwork. Uh, so between my husband and I, Terrence, uh, we split the load a lot. Uh, and so we're kind of looking out for each other. Uh, if a child needs to go to the toilet, then the other parent kind of, kind of stays back. Or, uh, or we're looking out to see if, you know, our children are hungry or not. And we're uh, looking out for, you know, uh, is that takeaway uh, or... Uh, or so, for example, we landed in uh, we landed in the UK uh, in uh, for a recent trip uh, when Anya was about two years old, and uh, and we landed in the evening, and we had to then drive straight away to Birmingham that that evening. Uh, so with children, you know, you can't kind of delay dinner uh, too long. Uh, so you have to be two steps ahead and think about dinner first. And so we had to from the airport collect the car and uh, while we're collecting the car my husband was already downloading apps to uh, to find takeaway spots nearest to you know nearest to where the car rental place was and so the minute we took the keys and we were off and packed all our bags into the car and on the way to Birmingham we were already driving to a place where we had already ordered food on the phone um, and so yeah so things like that you know just being two <laughs> steps ahead and kind of thinking about what the family needs first um, so there, there is a lot of teamwork uh, involved uh, when traveling with one or more children yeah that, that's super organized, you know. When I, when I try and do that with my own family, they all think I'm being anal, you know, <laughs> like planning things too far, too far ahead. But re recently, was it last year, when you, you each took a child and went to different places. So I want to know how you decided which child to take. Because you, you took Seth and Terence took Enya. Yep. Um, and how was that decision made? Good question. So I, I gave my husband, you know, dips first uh, because obviously, I, I mean, 
somehow or other, like between the parents, like usually the mom can handle whichever child, right? So I, I was very merciful and I gave Terrence the, the choice to make first. So we only had two. So, you know, one of each. Um, and Seth was five at the time and Enya was two, two plus. Um, he chose Enya for some reason. Uh, he chose to bring the younger uh, child on a holiday. And, uh, and I was like, yes, I get the older child, you know. Uh, so, uh, so I think uh, maybe just a backtrack of what holiday thing was. So Terence came up with this idea of let's bring our children on an extended dating experience. So not just like for a meal or for a day out, but, you know, let's bring them to a place that we have not been before and let's, let's explore that place with our children and make special memories with them. And so I was like, hey, why not? Because we tried to make annual holidays. So just for that year itself, we thought, okay, our annual uh, family holiday will become a holiday and so we chose the dates. We would fly on the same date and come back on the same date. And we would go to two destinations. Uh, I, uh, Seth and I left for Taiwan and then Terence and Enya went to, uh, to Hong Kong. Uh, so with that, I think uh, both of us really got our parenting, traveling uh, uh, abilities tested because uh, we were, you know, we were handling one child each and uh, but above and all that, I think it was a great experience just to cultivate special memories just between that parent and that child itself. So even up until today, uh, I was actually pretty surprised that Anya still talks about daddy bringing her to Hong Kong. Uh, so, you know, I, I went to um, uh, Ocean Park and I ate this and I ate that. And I'm like, but you're only two plus. How can you remember? But I think it's because of, you know, like smartphones where, you know, we constantly bring out photos and we remind them, hey, this is where you went. And those special memories really uh, helps them to kind of build their identity as well as children. Um, so, so, yeah, it takes a lot of teamwork, but I think it's a lot more fun when the family goes together and, uh, and you know, you really see the family dynamics working with one another and just siblings as well, getting, uh, working with one another in a different location and getting to know one another more. They don't care, compare holidays, like I had a better holiday than you or, you know, I, I had more fun than you or anything like that. They don't mm. do that. Maybe they're not at that age yet to do that. Yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe yeah. but we try to Skype every night. So we would ah. Skype every night and we'll tell each other, you know, what do we do for the day? And so that was more of like a downloading uh, and we could compare notes. Uh, and then we would also talk about, so what we're going to do tomorrow kind of thing. Right. But I think maybe uh, that's a good point. If we continue this holiday thing in the years to come, they might. Yeah, they, are, they might. Actually, I, I like the name holiday because I used to do that with my daughters. Uh, when I mean, the, that's 12 years uh, between them. So there was a lot of time when I only had one child. And we would go off uh, every year, just the two of us, mother, daughter. And it, it's really uh, a great time to really get to know each other very well and to see all the little quirks and things, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, I kind of miss those days because uh, now now they're all big. They don't want to travel with me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Lu they do. Yeah. Lucien, I, I can't remember how many children you have. I have two as well. Uh, three years apart, just like Seth and Enya. Uh, Lucas is eight and Lauren is five. Yes. Right. And do you normally travel together uh, as a family? Have you tried this holiday dating thing? No, but I think it's a fantastic idea. I wonder which child my husband would choose. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that's always interesting to see. And what, what are the factors that they consider, right? Uh, yeah. when, when they yeah. choose. So tell me, what, what in, in your experience of traveling with your kids, what's been the hardest and easiest thing about traveling with them? Well, the easiest, I would say, is um, getting them excited about the trip. Generally, they love holidays. They love um, the idea of getting away from the house, not having to do chores or so much homework. Uh, and it's really easy to, to get them excited about that. So when I'm doing the planning, I will try to get them involved. I'll show them the map where we are going, what we'll be doing. Sometimes we try to watch uh, videos of 
children at the destination to see you know what life is like for them is it the same is it different we also try to read stories from those places to, to sort of get an idea of the culture and generally they they love going on holidays um the hardest part i would say is when we actually get there and there's a lot of walking and or there's a lot of waiting for transportation or the ride or whatever it is a lot of downtime or tired then they get very cranky so that is tough when you just have to keep motivating them i find lots of snacks work a lot of looking right. for little parks to sit down in i think that helps yeah but in the end it is it is quite tough sometimes and then some sometimes you just have to say you know forget it let's just do one thing today and let's all enjoy it rather than slogging on and you know stressed waiting for the next train to arrive etc yeah. right I, i think we can't do all those sort of zip around um you know tours that that we do as adults with with little kids they just don't have the patience for it i don't think Actually I used to find the most difficult thing traveling with kids especially if you go far is jet lag because I suffer for, from it and they don't sometimes suffer from it or sometimes we're just totally out of sync and that I I found like I just want to sleep and there they are sort of like one thing and that used to be the most for me that was you know the worst thing of all Uh we are now at um 3 uh 30 or so and uh I welcome uh, questions from the audience out there if you have any but meanwhile let's let's just keep talking this holiday dating thing uh both of you Debra and uh, Lucian what what age do you think um is a good time to do that you know with with them do you think when they can walk or they can walk independently or or do you bring a little what do you call it stroller along or what what do you do because you know physically it can be tiring right yeah i i think there's no magic number like you know what what age i think really it's for the parent to decide uh when do they feel most comfortable uh kind of you know taking the lead and uh bringing that child on a holiday i mean it's it's not like a if you had to be forced to go on a holiday like then it wouldn't be a holiday right so uh so yeah there's no magic number but i think for us it had worked for 5 and 2 um so even at that time terence had to bring a sling so when he was exploring parts of hong kong anya still had two naps a day and so she would be inside the pouch sleeping and then while he got his coffee and did his you know uh, exploring and then waited for her to wake up and they'll have tea together and did a little bit more exploring so he was comfortable with that um and um and other people may or may not so there's no magic number so for my son we could have a lot more conversation during our holiday because he was already 5 and so i involved him in the decision making what he wanted to do for the day and he got to pack his own bag and be responsible for his own bag and so you know i could instill a lot more values uh, during the entire time and he also kept a travel journal during the time so we made like a really uh, very uh, diy makeshift travel journal i just printed out a few pages with a nice cover and then inside he got to decorate it write the dates stick all the stops and tickets and you know wrote down different things uh, that he liked about the day where we went what we explored how he felt and so even up until today it's in his really nice you know memory box and he often takes it out and looks through it and wants me to talk about the trip again and you know some days i'm like yes let's talk about it and some days i'm like oh again <laughs> kind of thing yeah yeah <laughs> But so, did, did you find you know how kids when they like something they want to do it over and over again did you find that he wanted to go to the same place over, again and again uh, uh yes or he he was open to doing different things he was open to doing different things because i told him like we had limited time and there was a lot to do in uh you know in taiwan and so we needed just to choose and do different things uh but um 
I think maybe just back to that point that Lucien brought up, you know, is the, the waiting time. Sometimes we're not in control of a lot of things when we're traveling, right? Uh, you know, the trains could come late or our flights can be delayed. So what I found was that I always pack activities for my kids, but I don't go overboard. So I don't have like an extra luggage just for activities for them. Over mm-hmm. time, the, you know, the bag kind of dwindles. It gets less and less. And uh, we start off with, a little bit more things first when they're young because their attention span is very you know short but as they grow older uh what we want to instill in them is the ability to appreciate what's around them to be observant of the people the the you know the environment to uh to take in the smells the sights everything and just to teach them to be still and to observe um so that's that's what we're trying to do but when they're younger i pack like lots of activity books um i realized that podcasts works very well with my my children so they have this uh yeah wireless headphones that they take around uh they they, you know they take on trips and stuff like that and i would just download podcasts uh stories for uh, kids oh i didn't know that so that that for me was quite uh, interesting because I didn't need to have a screen in front of them and they you know they're not carrying a phone or a tablet watching something all the time but they're listening to something and so you'll find you know I wrote a few pieces on uh, Zafigo as well on the holiday you see Seth on a uh, on a headphone right and uh, it's during uh, bus rides where uh, you know he'll pop on the headphone and he'll just listen to stories and things like that but I always tell him like okay we're two stops away all right so uh, once two stops away I will I will stop it so that he's aware that we need to get off the vehicle or to do certain things so he's not always plugged in Um, so that's a way to kind of keep them engaged with the travel but at the same time to have a little bit of their time as well to enjoy what they like yeah Right. I, I wonder if that's a, that's a mom thing, you know, to think of these things. I remember once flying back from Europe uh, with my daughter and then across the aisle, there was a young father with his little boy, really little boy. And that boy was screaming and crying and, and the, the father was just unable to cope. But luckily, I had my daughter's, you know, books and, and stuff. And so I just waked one up, gave it to this boy, and he shut up immediately, <laughs> you know, immediately. And I thought, how come you don't have all this stuff? You know, you should. So, yeah, preparedness with all these things is, is really necessary. Okay, I have a question from uh, Sue Tay, which I'll put to both of you. Uh, what are the most useful websites to check out when planning to travel with kids? Do you have, Lucien, do you have any that you refer to? I think it would, be t- it would depend on where you're traveling to. So on Facebook, there are a lot of uh, groups relevant to the destination. So probably you, you can search up those. Reddit has a lot of sub travel subreddits as well about those. Um, there is a Facebook group, Our Tribe Travels, which talks a lot about group travel I mean, with families and young kids. So I would definitely search those. But um, a lot of times it's just Googling destinations and how old your kids are. And there's usually some parents out there who would have relevant advice. Yeah, so that you can always just crib off there. Right. Sharing information, I think, is, is really key. So, um, well, we're now in this situation where we cannot go very far. And um, how, what do you tell your kids, you know, like if they're used to like, okay, we're going to go on a holiday and we're going to get on a plane and go somewhere. And this year we are not. I mean, it's hard enough for adults to cope with it. How do you, how do you cope? How, how have you kept your kids um, busy, uh, especially when they're not in school? Uh, when you can't really take them to too many places. Lucien, do you, what have you been up well, to? I would say they handled the MCO much better than I did. Uh, uh-huh. They were quite happy to be at home. They had access to both parents most of the time. And uh, of course, they had increased screen use due to work, I mean, sorry, to school and uh when we had to, you know, get chores done or do work ourselves, then we did resort to that. So I think they were, were quite okay. 
with it, I was going slightly crazy. And <laughs> I tell you when they said, oh, you know, people can go out to shop once a week for groceries. I was like, I'm going out, okay? I'm, <laughs> I need yeah. to do them yes. and get out. Right, so, right. Yeah. But um, after a while, we got into a routine and we tried to, we are lucky because we have a, a bit of a garden. So I tried to get them outside most days and uh, for a good part of the day and when we were allowed to later on we started walking or cycling around the neighborhood so just to to explore because I think normally we're in the car and we don't really see the small things and the lanes so we started doing that and uh, I think that helped getting outside was was really good right and Deborah what do you do Oh yeah, I totally agree that getting outside is so good and so helpful. Like, you know, just it feeds the soul and it feeds the mind. Um, so we have, uh, we're, we're quite blessed to be in Sabah. Um, so the beach is actually only 15 minutes away. Uh, and even during MCO, uh, well, during the real MCO, we didn't, we didn't do much. Uh, but we walked around the neighborhood, did a lot of cycling just around the neighborhood. But the minute RMCO hit, we were out on the beach, uh, just spending Saturday mornings there, picnicking, uh, and just hikes. Uh, so there are, you know, hikes, uh, trails about 15, 20 minutes away from where we are. Uh, so we did different uh, trails, uh, brought the children, uh, actually picnic, you know, we packed uh, food and stuff like that and then did a little bit of a hike and then once we reached the, the top we would sit down and then enjoy the meal and then hike back down so that would take like a good half a day uh, but it's good for them to just burn the energy and then we don't need to worry about the rest of the day actually um, thinking about I think just thinking about what we can do taking them out of the house uh, even if it's for 15 minutes it would help so one of the things that I found was that if you know in a day where I have I had to really work and uh, I had very little time to spend with them. Um, I would take them out just for 15 minutes, take a walk, but then we would do a bit of like nature studying. Uh, we would look at different plant species and we would try to identify different, uh, you know, different plants, different trees. And then lo and behold, we actually came upon a few caterpillars as well. So during the entire MCO, we, we had the joy of taking care of caterpillars and, uh, and seeing them become butterflies. Uh, so bringing nature into the house as well. Uh, so that's a little bit of a travel to us, uh, not being cooked up in the house. But what sort of, you know, we all have to, we all have these SOPs. Um, how do you instill that in children? I mean, you, you put masks on them, do you, but how do you talk to them about this need to, you know, socially distant and like they can't run up to their friends or, you know, how, how do you, how do you talk to them about this? Lucia, do you want to, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm actually, they have coped with that much better than I expected. I think uh, there have been a lot of uh, talks at schools and also on the internet. There have been books and videos, podcasts, all talking about this. So I think they do realize and they and they're they're pretty much compliant. I think they're compliant more compliant than a lot of adults that I see. So when they see everyone else doing the same thing, they follow accordingly. Oh. And oh. um yeah, so we try to practice it at home as much as possible, washing hands and, and all that. So they are okay with it. Um with their friends, of course, they get excited, but they see their friends also wearing masks, so they also try to keep their distance. So in the beginning, when we did meet up in RMCO, it was mostly in open outdoor areas. And so there wasn't any need to be too close to each other. And we just tried yeah. to, to play a part. Yeah. So but have, have birthday parties and all that ended? They have. I mean, I, I've seen a few start up, but... Uh, my son's birthday was during the MCO, so we had a Zoom party with his friends. Oh, we nice. played right. a quiz, Kahoot quiz games, and uh, we did like virtual games, and then we all got sent uh, uh, like a, a certificate virtually. I mean, we emailed it to them, so that was their, you know, their gift for attending. I have seen some now start up, um, but 
mostly I think people are, are keeping it to really small numbers and doing things outdoors. So one of my son's uh, friends had an outdoor cinema party on the rooftop. And so oh, everybody clever. was distanced, yeah. And then they just projected the movie on the side of the wall. And then oh. uh, they just had pizza separately. So it was all following SOP and the kids had a good time. See, it's just a matter of imagination, isn't it? That, you know, mm-hmm. we put our mind to it. We can think of, of uh, how to, to work, around, work around it, isn't it? Yeah, and um, lots of positive reinforcement as well. Like, you know, yes. instead of just scaring them about the virus, like, you know, just tell them when, when you, we see them actually practicing some self-control and, and having some social distance, then you can just tell them like, hey, look, you know, I, I noticed that you were standing away from your friends and uh, good job on that. And, you know, or like closing your mouth when you cough and things like that. So I think a lot of positive reinforcement instead of fear uh, that that would help too. Right, right. Um, okay, any more questions from the audience? Uh, not so many. I think you all are just so full of... Uh, the, are there any um, particular places uh, that you recommend for people to take their kids nowadays? Within Malaysia, obviously, because uh, right now, that's uh, all where we can go. Any particular spots that you think are just really ace for taking kids to what's your favorites what are your favorites besides the beach yeah i think if you know it this is like the perfect time to explore nature-based uh uh holidays places where you know you're closer to maybe the jungle or you know rivers and things like that just kind of kind of slightly away from urban spots it would be nicer uh, so if, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to fly to Sabah anytime soon, but uh, just people <laughs> in Sabah, uh, places like the Kinabatangan would be great because you're really away from, you know, city centers uh, and uh, um, just national parks where you can really travel but not have to worry about social distancing and things like that. Uh, yeah, so that, that, would, that would be a tip. Lucian, do you have any favorite places? Well, we went to Cameron Highlands twice <laughs> this year ah. for some reason, but um, we really enjoyed it. The weather was very cooling and uh, we, the kids loved it. And we traveled with um, one or two other families. So we n- knew that they also socially distanced. So we felt safe to travel with them and we stayed together. And um, I think what they say, who you travel with matters. So if you are planning to go on a holiday, I think it's pretty safe because, and especially if you stay in um, either a hotel which has taken all the precautions or in your own Airbnb or bungalow or chalet, then it's pretty safe and um, you, you'll be all right with that. So places like Cameron's, Janda Bay, all these places are quite close, driving distance and great access to outdoors and kids will want to be outdoors doing the, you know playing at the stream or hiking or running around the garden so for them it's fun and uh it's nice because you are in a bubble but you you have already you know sort of screened who you are going to be with and you don't have to worry about crowds things like that right right um you know i haven't been to cameron highlands since i was 11 <laughs> Because uh, my parents packed us all into the car and we, you know, we are four or five kids uh, plus a a nanny and plus two of them. So very cramped. I can't remember whether we had aircon, but the windy road up just nearly killed me and I swore never to go again. So maybe I should give it another shot, but (laughs) that, that, you know, was misery for me. Which, which leads me to ask both of you, I mean, when you were young, did, did your parents take you traveling as well, whether around the country or, or overseas or? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> is, that, is that Lauren? Yes, that's Lauren, <laughs> just come back. <laughs> 
Um, so when I, when I was young, uh, we did a lot of local travel first. Um, I think it's the reverse now, like people tend to buy a ticket and go overseas first. Uh, what my, my parents did was, that was way before Air Asia, you know, uh, existed. And so not everybody could travel at the time. So we did a lot of road trips. I remember like, you, you know, sitting uh, at the back of the car and going through uh, trunk roads and it was... Um, Actually, we, we went to Penang a lot. We would leave in the middle of the night at 2 and then end up, you know, uh, arriving in Penang in the morning and ready for breakfast. And, you know, it was an eating sash the whole way through. Uh, and we also traveled to, we uh, drove into Singapore a lot. We did a lot of kind of uh, just road trips around Malaysia to PD, even to Trunganu, did a lot of snorkeling and, and things like that. Uh, before we actually took our first overseas, our overseas trip to you know, places like Australia and, and so forth. Um, that, in fact, shaped a lot of how I see the world, actually, uh, because it showed me a lot of my own country first. And so we, you know, just as a Malaysian, I try all kinds of different foods. I met different people. I walk into different alley lanes. And because my dad uh, is, uh, you know, he was a photographer, uh, and he loved taking like big gears with him. So he would spend a lot of time taking pictures and it, it instilled patience uh, in us as children. So we were not allowed to whine or to ask like, are you done yet? Uh, at, you know, we just had to wait until he's finished and we couldn't even see the pictures because at that time you had to wait until the pictures were developed, right? So we just had to wait and just trust that he was taking good pictures. But in that waiting time, um, for me, I can speak for myself, I got to see a lot of, just daily life of people. I, you know, people watched a lot. I just kept quiet and just, you know, looked at how uh, things were, things were going on, uh, how food vendors would sell things, you know, the different ways that they would speak to each other in different dialects. And, uh, and it just brought me a greater appreciation for, I think, just for this nation uh, and also a deeper sense of curiosity as well. So, because if you're in a place long enough and you're not zooming by, a lot more questions would come up, you know, why is that auntie selling uh, Goreng Pisang at this price? And uh, is that her son, you know, next to her? Or is, you know, who is helping her kind of thing? So a lot of curiosity came out from that. Um, so I, I think, and I, I would, you know, it would be safe for me to say that the way my parents brought us up and brought us traveling has instilled a sense of curiosity in us. Yeah. Uh, my parents viewed travel as educational as well. So... Yeah, they, they would take us around where they could as well. What about you, Lucian? Did, did you have to be packed into cars and go on trips too? Yes, um, we travel mostly to my mom's hometown in Sremban. And my father was born in Singapore, so we travel a lot to Singapore. And in between, we would stay in places like Fraser's Hill, um, Lumut, Port Dixon, those, those nearby areas. So those, we didn't go overseas much except for Singapore um, and it was more like local travel which I found interesting but as I grew up I think I was very interested in travel and more in terms of like exploring locally as well so yeah. you know in my traveling with friends or uh, exploring that way yeah. right I, I think one of the the good side effects or benefits of, of this uh, lockdown or this COVID is that we're discovering our own country, actually, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, people are going to, you know, like beaches and all that. And, you know, they see one person go there, like, one family go there, like, oh, let's try that. And I, I think it's great. I, I just took a road trip around the country as well. And it, it was fantastic. Never done it before. So uh, there's a question um, talking about everything nice and good, but what was the worst trip you've ever taken? Hmm. Well, that's... Uh, for, Hasn't for, come yet. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've, I've had uh, quite bad trips, but then I think the worst that comes uh, off the top of my head right now would be uh, not related to children, but it was the trip where I had... Uh, um, I had a miscarriage actually, and it was oh. in India. Yeah. yeah, so that was before Seth came along, um, and so uh, it was quite nightmarish because I was in a new place and India of all places. But 
the well the flip side of it was we were staying with friends and so when that happened uh we had the comfort of friends and they could then you know recommend uh, a hospital to go to and the procedures and everything else so that was quite a scare um and it yeah. was an episode that i've also written about uh, in my book um so yeah uh, that was you, that was you knew you were pregnant then you did know I, I knew that I was pregnant and uh, we actually had known that, uh, the, you know, the pregnancy was not going through. Uh, but my gynae had said, you know, if, uh, had given me the green light to go basically, but just to look oh. out for signs. But what happened was that I ended up uh, kind of over bleeding and uh, it, was, it was just crazy. Uh, so yeah, it happened in, uh, in Agra. So we were... Uh, taking a trip yeah, to see the Taj Mahal and everything. And, uh, and Delhi was the closest city then. So, um, so with all of that happening, I had to take an overnight train from Agra, Agra right up to Delhi and then straight into a hospital. Thankfully, I didn't need ambulance or whatever. Uh, and, and because of friends and recommendation and everything, uh, they brought us like, you know, they, they just pointed us to the right hospital uh, with the right doctors and everything was settled actually overnight. So uh, oh, it, wow. the nightmare happened overnight and then just the train ride and then with the procedures and everything, it was very smooth. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't a very pleasant uh, holiday. Oh, I'm, sh I'm sure. Gosh, that, that sounds terrible. Yeah. Lucien, did you have any dramatic yeah. <laughs> trips? Oh, I'm like... so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that, Deborah. Yeah, yeah, that must have been very, very traumatic. Um, no, mine not so much. Um, I think the most uh, that I can think of is when we were in Japan and the night uh, we had a very early morning flight. And when I woke up my son to get to the airport, I found that he was running a fever. So we really had to scramble and we were trying to decide should we make the trip or not. And But luckily we, we got some meds as well. I mean, at that time, and he managed to have his fever down and then we traveled with him. So that, that was a bit scary because we, we weren't sure what we should do. And... We were not sure it was a serious thing or just a cold and fever. But yeah, I think that was the worst thing that was, was language ever a problem when you travel? Uh, I mean, if you're traveling to a non-English speaking country, I mean, how do you communicate, when, especially when you have these sort of problems? Mm. Would you ever find that? Yeah, so whenever we travel to non-English speaking countries, we always try to... Uh, research beforehand so wherever we're staying we look for like an international clinic or hospital the nearest address so normally if they say international means that somebody will be able to speak English so we made sure to to have all that and now with Google Translate it's, it's actually really easy so you can just translate and you even have can scan the, the text and you can see what it is translated into and what I found really helpful is you find you google for a picture of what you want you screenshot it and you show it to the pharmacist or whoever and then they can sort of recognize what it is from there because uh, they may not be able to speak it but they they can recognize the the characters quite easily yeah and there was a pharmacy in the airport as well which was really helpful ah uh, great yeah. great so we're almost coming to the end so i i'm going to ask you a, a question for both of you, which is uh, general, uh, but could you give our participants one piece of advice that you've learned through your experiences in life, um, you know, that, that, that you feel is really particularly uh, profound or, or whatever? What would, what would it be? Hmm. In, I mean, not just related to travel, doesn't have to be related to travel, but your life overall, all the things that you've done. What piece of advice would you give our participants? I think in relation to children and traveling or children in general, what I've been finding is that there's no point to try and shelter them too much. So we are trying to let them lead and fail. So like when we go on holidays, as I mentioned, I try to get them involved. And now that they're older, they can also 
plan a little bit and tell us, you know, what they would want to do. And I try to let them lead maybe one day on each holiday so that they will be in charge of deciding where to do, where to go, what to do. And if it doesn't work out, they just have to learn how to deal with it, you know, like, oh, we'll just take the next bus or what can we do? So right. if we keep sheltering them, then I find that um, they don't learn. they will always just be looking to you like, oh, what should I do now? What should I do now? Then, So ask them back. Say, what do you think you should do? What should we do now? You know, let them try. I, I think that's brilliant because mm-hmm. I wish I, I had had that advice when I was, when my kids were much younger because I find that even to this day, I'm the tour manager, tour guide, f and manager, everything. And it's really, really tiring. Um, uh, actually, there's another question that maybe we can handle uh, briefly before you get to that question, uh, Deborah. Someone asked, how do you handle tantrums when traveling? Or do you never get tantrums? You're so well planned, so well organized, so thinking ahead that you never get tantrums. Do you get tantrums? Oh my gosh! If I can, you, I mean your kid. Yeah. Well, I'm <laughs> sure you? our stages. Well, our, our stages of like throwing tantrums when we were younger, and our parents had to deal with it. But um, if I can just tell you a story about tantrums. So we were in Russia, and um, and if you've seen those egg surprises where the entire chocolate, uh, you know, the entire egg is a chocolate, and you have a toy inside. So um, my my children happen to take a liking to it. So wherever we go, we'll look for egg surprises, egg surprises, egg surprises. And we were in Russia and we happened to walk into a supermarket. Uh, it was then only uh, Seth at the time and we were doing the Trans-Siberian Railway trip. And we, both Terence and I were so excited when we stepped into the supermarket and we saw like trays and trays of egg surprises. And then we walked straight in and we were like, Seth, look at the trays of egg surprises we couldn't even finish the line and he was on the floor behind us throwing a crazy tantrum for no reason whatsoever so we had we had no clue you know what happened we were obviously thinking that we were two steps ahead we had found something that he liked and it was all the tick boxes that you you think that you've done right as a parent right and then he there he was on the floor kicking and screaming throwing a tantrum and how did we handle that zinli uh we basically stopped. We had to calm down because we were so so excited about the egg surprises. We had to basically focus on him and tell him, you know, what's happening. Um, and he just wouldn't, you know, if you've spoken to a child with a tantrum, nothing really goes in. And so we had to just calm down and say, look, Seth, uh, if you're not going to stop, we will have to carry you and we're going to take you out. And so he didn't stop, right? And there were more eyes on us. And so we had to carry him and we had to take him out of the supermarket. And then we had to wait until everything calmed down and then we asked him why. And so I think it was just a little trigger that we were walking too fast and he thought in his mind that we did not wait for him. Like, you know, because we were so excited uh-huh. about the egg surprises. And so uh-huh. because of that, he couldn't communicate that we were walking too fast and he threw a tantrum. And so um, in cases like that, I think it's so important for parents just to be calm and not react to the situation, uh, but instead like just come down to their level and realize that they are going through a, an emotion that is maybe too big for them to handle and they mm-hmm. may not be able to express it in words. And so some of the ways is to actually just physically take them out of the place so that they have a safe space that, where you can speak to them uh, and, and reason with them, right? So, uh, so one of the things that I learned as well that is that children... Uh, are they they understand a lot and you don't need to wait until they're old like seven or eight or nine before you can start reasoning with them they actually know and they are able to process thought and so come down to their level and speak their language and ask them like how how are you know what's what's going on do you want to tell me uh thankfully that episode kind of calmed down and we walked back into the supermarket together and then we chose some egg surprises and then we walked out with some egg surprises so uh, just ah. stay calm when tantrums happen. And if you can, just be two steps ahead. Like, you know, look out to see whether, uh, would they be hungry soon? Uh, are they going to be tired soon? And that's going to reduce a lot of possible tantrums. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. I think we sometimes forget, you know, to look at the world from a little child's 
point of view, yeah. which, you know, which is very different. Like, you know, we, we don't even notice, right, that we're walking too fast for them. So we're coming to the end of the session. Uh, I really want to thank both of you, uh, Deborah and Lucien, for all these wonderful insights, all of which I wish I had <laughs> when I was, I was uh, young. And I, I really want to thank everyone who's joined us today. Uh, I hope that they, you found it all useful. Um, and before we end, can I ask everyone to switch on your video cameras again so that we can take, so Zin can take um, a photo of everyone. Hello. I hope everyone's still here. Hi, 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 hi. Awesome. We see some oh. kids in the background as well. All right. <laughs> They're listening intently. Like, this is what I've got to get mom to do this time. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else is coming on? Hi. Can a few more so that we can... Uh, ooh, there are 20 people here. Who else? Um, any more so that we can get a nice group photo? Ooh, this Jenny, Lisa. Um, yeah, that. Okay, let's let's try and do one first. So everyone, look at the camera. Okay, and one, two, three. Smile, smile. Hi, how many? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyone else coming on? No. Well, <laughs> thank you again, Deborah and Lucien for a wonderful wonderful um session today i you know is i hope those with little kids and i do see one little kid at least there mm -hmm. um uh, found it very useful i think you know so many tips uh that you've learned from your experience so i hope you all uh keep well and safe and once we can travel again i hope that all what we've learned today will come in useful so thank you once again, and please do look out for our next episode of Hello Zapigo, which will be in about two weeks' time, uh, where we'll be talking about travel with disabilities and how it shouldn't stop you at all. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.